So the Darwin Initiative project is a collaborative project to protect the marine biodiversity of Chagos, funded by DEFRA, the Department of Environment, um, Food and Rural um, Affairs. And this is a project held jointly between the School of Ocean Sciences at Bangor University, University of Warwick, the Zoological Society of London, and the Biot of the FCO. And the Chagos Conservation Trust are also um, a, an important partner in this project. And uh, these Darwin projects, at least in the round when we applied for the funds, which was some time ago, round 19, these are collaborative. They should have real impact on the country. They should represent high quality science and good value for money. And they should be a catalyst for future initiatives. And we're pleased to say that from this early Darwin Initiative project, others have sprung. So it's proving to be just such a catalyst. And these projects should draw on UK expertise. And we've gone further. We've drawn on international expertise. They should work with local partners rich in biodiversity, but poor in the financial resources to achieve the conservation of biological diversity. And they should really address quite a lot of things, institutional capacity building, as well as research, training, education, and awareness. And the projects really are designed to help a country meet the obligations under the three main conventions. The Convention on Biological Diversity, which incidentally doesn't actually apply in BIOT, but um, the, the idea is BIOT tries to meet it as far as it possibly can. Um, the Convention on Migratory Species of, of Wild Animals, we already heard quite a lot about the sharks and turtles, and they're not the only, other, uh, only species, of course, that migrate, the birds and other species as well. And then the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which, of course, will um, have some power over those organisms that might be uh, traded in this region. Now, the aim of the project has been to strengthen the Chagos MPA. The idea is to provide the scientific knowledge for further effective management and to develop a strategy that really engages the support of the potential stakeholders through outreach, education, and engagement. And the legacy will be sound management with increased value of what is the world's largest marine protected area that is no take, and, of course, it's also a very important, unique, and globally important reference site. So the first objective of the project has been very much to do with continuing the established baselines. Charles talked about some of the early work that's been done, and this Darwin project is trying to build on that and to establish permanent transect lines, for instance, permanent areas that will be surveyed to help us understand the magnitude of impacts, be they come from climate change um, or any other future impacts, such as possible human resettlement, or indeed island restoration type projects that uh, uh, are beginning to be thought about. Now, the second objective has been to provide scientific diving and safety equipment on site so we don't have to keep taking it out there every single year. Um, for many years, Charles has been dragging equipment around the world and to leave some of it there, but it, we really needed a secure base for this very expensive equipment that we require to operate in this region. In fact, partly um, to, to follow that along, one of the things that we've done is we've bought a container laboratory that sits on the upper deck, you can see it here, of the Pacific Marlin. Um, this can be put on when an expedition goes out on the Marlin. It can be taken off in between and gives the opportunity for scientists to have their own area in which to work out of the way of the, the crew when they're getting on with their own jobs. It's quite a neat little unit, air-conditioned, um, welded onto the decks, and um, conveniently, it's got a nice area for working on samples outside. And it's well kitted out within um, with seawater, electricity, and storage space, which 
really has, has allowed us just to be able to work longer um, into the night um, on the many samples that come in during these projects. It's also very conveniently situated next to the officer's lounge on the ship where um, a unique seminar series goes on each night during expeditions. And here the Shigossian um, um, bursary fellow who joined the expedition, uh, Yannick Mandarin, is giving one of these seminars to, to, to the group in that particular evening, telling us all about the meanings of the names of the islands, I think, as I remember that night. Now, we've also developed risk assessments for working safely in biot. This is important because we've got people working on the ship, off islands, and so on, and we've really had to up the game in safety to some extent, so a certain amount of training is done on board. And also, of course, we've developed diving and small boat rules for, for uh, operations um, within uh, Chagos. And this includes safe operations working on board what is quite a complex vessel and is not a vessel set up for scientific work. So we're having to adapt to work around a crew who are extremely helpful and very supportive of the sort of work that we're doing. Now, the third objective as a project has been the engagement of Chagossians. We've, we've helped support the outreach activity, which is jointly run by CCT, BIOT, ZSL, and the Darwin Initiative. And I was very proud to host a visit of the Chagossians up to Anglesey to do some cold water surveys. Um, but of course, this project will be extended. We've heard a little bit about it, but there are plans to operate in the future in Mauritius and Seychelles um, to, to train Chagossians further afield. And of course, the project <coughs> offers six bursaries, along with another bursary from CCT, um, to support Chagossians in training, more specialized training, and um, also, of course, the opportunity for a Chagossian to join each expedition. Now, the fourth objective of the project is increased public awareness in the UK, hence the involvement and support of this meeting, but also future meetings in Diego Garcia and internationally, and that we want to promote the high value of the Chagos MPA and the value of the, these um, intact ecosystems um, in other parts of the world. We really want to say what the Chagos can do, and this is part of this membership, the big ocean network that Daniel was telling us about earlier on today. Now, there are three Darwin expeditions funded in the project. The first has already happened, February, March, led by Charles. Um, the next one is in March, April, um, to be led by Heather Calderway from ZSL, and the final one um, is in April 2015, um, which I will lead. Now, the 2013 scientific expedition involved this um, long list of scientific um, participants from around the world. We've got people, we, we've, well, you've heard from, from Daniel, but um, we've had contributions from the California Academy of Sciences from James Cook University in uh, Australia, um, a, 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 as well as British participants, some of whom have spoken at previous meetings. And there's a little indication of the sort of work that was going on last year. I won't go through all those projects. You've, you've heard about some of them. Um, but some of them are illustrated here. For instance, looking at coral recruits, putting in these artificial reef um, um, structures, which can allow monitoring. The same structures are put in on reefs around the world to see what sorts of organisms um, use these structures. Um, we've heard about some of the bird work from Pete Carr um, and Daniel with his um, antipatherians and sponges, but there's been a lot of exciting work going on this, this year in Chagos. The focus of future expeditions um, are listed there. Essentially, we'll continue the monitoring, but each year we're trying to introduce new areas, um, particularly looking once again at coral disease, um, some of the projects along running, like sea temperature monitoring, but important projects are going to be looking at the grouper um, populations, the populations of parrotfish, 
what's happening to the coconut crabs, and in future years, we've got projects that have already begun but need to be reassessed after some years, such as coral growth estimates, for instance, and uh, seaweed fish biomass. So these are all projects that are, are going to be ongoing in the future years. Now, um, I don't want to move on, really, to look at some of the long-term monitoring of coral in, in Chagos. And Daniel Bailey and Anna Gracia Saiz have been involved in some of the analysis of this work as well. Um, we've already heard from Charles earlier on today about some of the sea surface temperature anomalies that have caused bleaching, um, particularly in 97, 98. Um, here, but also there have been subsequent events in the early 2000s which have caused incidences of coral bleaching and mortality in Chagos. And Charles has shown us at the beginning today of how these reefs have been recovering and actually the good news, as Charles was saying, is that the coral cover levels are now beginning to approach, and this is the 2012, beginning to approach the levels that were seen in uh, the late 1970s, which is very, very encouraging. And this is what happens in an area where we've got quite resilient coral reefs. However, Charles, he's been around since Charles Darwin's time, we think, doing this sort of work, and, and he's not going to be around forever. And um, there's a real problem with shifting baselines in many ways. New scientists coming in, um, Charles' data is terrifically detailed, but new scientists need to be able to see it. They need to revisit some of these areas. And I think archival video is a very valuable way of storing information, and new scientists can come along and, and look at this. Now, this sort of video isn't uh, necessarily the pretty sort of video that we're going, we saw this morning and are going to see again later on. So this is the sort of video that we're collecting during video transex. Um, and what this is really is, it's, it's very detailed video that is, is showing um, the algae, the calcareous, other materials, the small corals, the sponges. Um, all of these are being recorded in this sort of video such that in the future we can revisit these sites and other scientists can go and look at the, um, the, the numbers of different species that compose these reef environments. Uh, so here we can see calcareous um, algae, the, the, the pinky colors, a lot of uh, green calcareous algae, the Antip antipatharians that um, um, Daniel was talking about. We've got sponges and corals and hydroids, and all of these species are being recorded in, in these sorts of surveys. I'm afraid we're not seeing it at the high resolution at which it's actually recorded here, um, but this is, is, is very detailed and useful video material. Um, if we could just switch back again to the slides, thank you. So these archival video sequences are um, <coughs> a shot um, underwater coming up from the deeper depths at 25 meters up towards the surface. Um, there are advantages of using this sort of technique. Um, not only is the data archival, we can revisit it in future years and see exactly what was there, particularly looking at perhaps aspects that we didn't recognize as being important um, many years ago, but now are valuable. So this is one of the, the advantages of archival video. But also, the, the equipment is small, it's reliable, it's high definition. We can jump in at pretty much any site and record this sort of information without necessarily pre-knowledge of that site. Um, and then it allows us to analyze this video in the comfort of the office with necessary identification guides and so on. There are some negatives. The resolution isn't as high as eyeballing it for yourself. And, of course, it takes a lot of anal analysis time to work through the video once back in the laboratory. It is also quite high cost, and there are problems sometimes of assessing scale and depth reliably, but we're, we're addressing that using lasers and, and diving computers in the camera for this coming year. The methodology is 
essentially to work with the video equipment in five depth bands between 25 and 20 meters, moving up in 10 meter depth, depth bands, um, uh, sorry, five meter depth bands up until five meters depth, and um, recording video at a sort of 45 degree angle so we see the structure of the communities. And then this video is essentially subsampled by extracting frame grabs, which are almost equivalent to, to taking quadrats underwater in many ways. We can, we can grab many um, frames of video to assess and analyze. And this is done using some software designed by the National Coral Reef Institute in Florida, which allows you to overlay points over each frame grab and then assess what is under each point, identify the coral or the sponge or whatever it is, plug it in to a database, and this will generate spreadsheets of it information. So it's a, it's a very valuable tool. We've collected data at over 20 sites at four atolls back in 2006, and the map illustrates some of these great many sites carefully documented so that we can revisit them. And we've been, in 2013, trying to repeat as many of these sites as possible, and we'll continue to do this in 2014. <coughs> Again, um, the sites being illustrated just here. The sort of data that we get, then, is a detailed breakdown of the structure of the coral reef communities at different sites, here illustrated for Peros Banos, the red dots illustrating the sites from 2006, and here very similar data collected in 2013. Now it's late in the day for people to be looking at graphs, especially. I've got a few to show, but um, I'll interpret what these are really meaning with some photographs shortly. So we have life form coral cover here, uh, life form cover rather in percent um, here for different groups of organisms such as hard corals, soft corals at each atoll. And here we have the same data for 2013. And although there's quite a lot of noise in this data, we are noticing a fall in corals, which is interesting because the corals have been increasing in their cover up to 2012 and we're seeing perhaps an increase in some other species and a decrease in corals, which is quite interesting in 2013. Using this data, we've been able to compare um, the, the communities that exist in both seaward sites and lagoon sites, and we've got a detailed understanding of the breakdown of the organisms that contribute to, to these sites, and we can analyze these, and we can pull out the sites with these multi-dimensioning scaling plots where the um, green sites show seaward sites, the blue sites show lagoon sites, and we can see here that they, they're actually quite different in their, in their composition. And um, we can look at then at the hard coral cover specifically at different depth bands. Um, we have data here again from 2006 for each atoll at the different depth bands. And again, the same data for 2013 from video recording, and we've been able to compare this with some of Charles's observations taken at the same time by the visual methodology, which is quite useful because it sort of counter calibrates the data um, with Charles's earlier studies. And the video data actually generally comes out um, often a little higher in the percent covers, and that's probably because um, we've got more time to drill down and see more of the organisms when you're in the comfort of a lab looking at the data compared whether you're underwater actually eyeballing it. Uh, but the patterns are actually very similar when you, when you look at it and you sort of take out some of the noise in, in this data. I haven't got time to describe it in detail now, but really what I'm trying to illustrate is the sort of data that we have and the comparisons that we can make. In 2006, it was very evident that coral cover was higher in shallow waters compared with deep waters, and rubble was, uh, dead coral and rubble was, was, was pretty equal across the depths. Um, we haven't quite been able to do the same analysis this year because of noisier data, but in 2013, we're, we're, 
we're seeing a similar pattern, but with lower levels of coral cover, particularly in shallow waters. And we're perhaps seeing greater amounts of dead coral in shallow waters compared with deeper waters, which is rather interesting. And we, we've gone into a lot of detail with this data, comparing 2006 and 2013, all sorts of measures of, of diversity, evenness, richness for seaward sites, uh, various different assessments. And you, you can compare just quickly with your eyes some of these graphs, and you can see there are quite big differences between 2006 and 2013, both at seaward sites and at lagoon sites. Now, it's rather complicated to, to understand this, but I think we can interpret some of this data when we really look to see what's been happening. So here we have, for instance, tabula acropora dominated reefs, typical of, of the shallower waters before 2013. This is what it would have been like in, in 2012 in many areas. But in 2013, we've noticed a sort of senescence in many of these table corals. They seem to have grown up all at the same time following those early ble bleaching events in 1997 and the early 2000s. And now they seem to have reached a size where they're either reaching a, an age where they're beginning to die off naturally or they're being broken by storms. And um, what we're also noticing, though, are the numbers of what we call secondary framework species, other corals now coming up between these corals. And gradually, we're seeing the reef changing, really, with a secondary framework development of much higher biomass. So we've not just got all these table corals, but we're now increasingly getting these secondary framework species, which give much higher diversity to the reefs. We're also seeing, of course, and, and one of the things Charles was assessing <laughs> with the recruits, we're seeing a lot of recruits of these corals beginning to, to settle on the calcareous and dead coral substrates. Now, what we're seeing really fits some of the concepts of reef growth that were, were presented in the early 70s, where you have framework building corals. These are gradually replaced by secondary framework species, which would begin small in size and biomass, but then increase and essentially become the main part of the reef as it cements together and begins to infill. So I think that's what's beginning to happen now um, with, with, with the reefs in Chagos. However, we're also seeing some other effects. This is um, in Salomon, below 15 metres this year, and we can see virtually every coral is dead below 15 metres in Salomon Lagoon. And this was of some concern and suggests that there has been a mortality event, perhaps due to high sea surface temperatures, and we have some data loggers that will be assessed in the future to see actually what has happened. But as we come above 15 metres, we see that most of the corals are alive in the Salomon Lagoon and, in fact, extremely rich and diverse. So something has happened below 15 metres between 2012 and 2013. And this is what some of this data is beginning to, to pick up. And we'll be monitoring this in future surveys. We've also noticed at certain sites, particularly lagoon sites in some of the islands like Danger Island, Eagle Island, Egmont, um, the crown of thorn starfish, Acanthaster planchii, which is a coral predator. And it's quite clear that a lot of the damage that appears to have been done in shallow water, in this case, probably in the sort of 10 to 5 meter area, we're seeing a lot of dead acropora corals, particularly the, the, these branching corals, and some of the parietes are also um, fed upon. These are the rounded corals that you can see here. Um, and this would appear to be crown of thorns starfish damage. And we can see the crown of thorns here. These are quite young ones, juvenile ones, that <coughs> seem to be reaching very high numbers in some of these lagoons and accounting for some of the changes that we're seeing. Now, I think what we're seeing here, again, is something that has been picked 
picked up and described in the literature here, Schumacher in 1977, described the phases of reef growth. And we can see here diversity over a log frame in time here. So in the first um, half year or so of, uh, of a new reef developing or a reef after, after bleaching where there's been a lot of mortality, we get diatoms and algae settling on the, the surfaces. And this is the preparatory phase Invertebrates then begin to settle, and after about a year, we get corals settle, settling. And these are the primary framework corals that begin to grow up in the region, such as those fast growing um, tabular corals and branching corals. And then the secondary species begin to come in after about seven or more years, and this is perhaps what we're beginning to see now after. Um, 13, 14 years after the big bleaching events. Um, perhaps some of them were only seven or so years ago in the um, earlier 2000s. And we're now beginning to see an increase in diversity as the secondary framework species begin to develop. Now, a moderately exposed reef tends to develop well and after 20 to 50 years probably reaches a climax state. But if this reef is constantly being knocked back by storm conditions, then generally it won't reach those levels of diversity. But what we're probably also seeing, and increasingly so, are catastrophic events due to warm waters, possibly due to crown thorn starfish as well, which are going to keep knocking back these reefs. And this is probably the future. This is what's actually happening for our, in the reefs of Chagos. Um, we're going to probably be aware in the future that the reefs keep growing back, but then being knocked back as well. And this is something we need to be able to, 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 to measure. Now, Charles has done some modeling. This has been published in, in, in Nature, which shows the likely increases in sea surface temperatures. This is real data. This is model data here um, for the Indian Ocean. Um, and we can see here that temperatures are expected to, to increase as we get towards the end of the century, and this is supported by, by the IPCC, International Panel for Climate Change, data as well. Um, whether some of this will be mitigated to some extent by the coral reefs themselves and so on, we're, we're not sure, but it's likely that these heating events are going to continue and the corals are probably going to get knocked back. Now, it may be the corals can adapt, and work's already gone in, on in Chagos as well as other places about the algae that live inside the corals and whether they, they can actually adapt to bleaching, possibly um, by changing their symbiotic algae for species that are temperature um, more tolerant, different clades of algae, or perhaps they can shuffle their algae and have different population within the corals themselves. There are various um, hypotheses that, that can be tested as, uh, 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 as we see these future changes. Now, at this point, we should just be aware that um, generally coral reef scientists are accepting that um, there are various drivers that can change coral reefs. And quite a lot of the work by Hughes and co-workers has been showing that coral reefs can shift from a coral-dominated state to an algal-dominated state when these changes occur. And um, this can be driven often by drivers such as overfishing, by overnutrification, by seawater warming and acidification, various um, aspects of climate change that are, are, are going to shift corals reefs from a coral state to an algal state. And the problem is, how do you get these reefs back to a coral state. It's a difficult thing to achieve. And to a certain extent, um, corals remain resilient, and even though these stresses are occurring, provided the coral reef doesn't actually go to a state beyond this dotted line, they're resilient enough to go back to a coral state. But when we tip over this line, Hughes and co-workers have neatly demonstrated that the reef then shifts to this macroalgal state. Uh, due to these drivers. They push them over the edge, essentially. So what we've got to be able to do is to try and control some of these drivers. 
And in a recent paper by uh, Peter Mumby, uh, just out this year, um, it's made it very clear that strict no-take marine reserves do actually confer this resilience. No-take marine reserves where fishing of parrotfish, for instance, is prohibited, can, can <coughs> ensure that we've got the parrotfish and other fish in these communities to, to actually increase the resilience of the reefs by grazing algae and allowing the reef to, to bounce back, to be resilient. If the reef is unprotected, um, then this is less likely to happen. So I think that really brings me to the conclusion, a little bit of a forward look to um, what's happening. We've, we've got some ideas of what might be happening to the coral reefs of Chagos in the future. And this means that the greatest priority has to be to try and maintain reef resiliency. And that means we've got to manage those drivers that it's possible for us to manage, like overfishing, like nutrients, for instance. And this means that we've really got to back up. We've got to ensure this resolve to continue the strict marine reserve of Chagos. We've got to ensure that it is a fully no-take marine reserve with no habitat mod modification. And it means we've got to have enhanced and very vigilant enforcement if we're going to be able to do that. So that's got to be one of our major aims in the next 20 years, for sure. And probably most of it's got to happen in the next few years. Science in the MPA is likely to expand, and Matt has already talked a little bit about this today with the work that was discussed at the Geneva Conference. And um, this means that the science is going to mean more scientists are probably going to be going to um, Chagos, and hopefully they're going to be um, supported by Biot, and I think Biot uh, are also keen to be engaged in, in the process of, of helping undertake some of the measurement work that can be done by staff there as well. Um, but this widening science brief means that we've got to ensure that that science is not destructive. And this means that there's got to be um, really um, carefully managed science. It means that um, a lot of the work that's being developed on the, on the Darwin Initiative project will go on. That's going to establish baselines for organisms like groupers and so on, which we can build on. And the GIS that Elizabeth described earlier is going to be very important as a central database in this. Um, but this increased science activity means that there are going to be a growth in facilities, and we're almost certainly going to require hyperbaric medical support in a more advanced state in the future, particularly if we're opening this up to more scientists with perhaps wider, wider backgrounds. Um, Mauritian scientists have been invited to take part in the Darwin Initiative, um, but the Prime Minister's office um, in Mauritius will not grant them permission to collaborate with us, which is a great shame. This is a missed opportunity. It was one of the aims of the Darwin Initiative project. Mm -hmm. The scientists are willing, the government isn't, and of course some of this is going to be um, rather due to the arbitrary uh, trial tribunal, um, which is now delayed until 2014. But we hope that in the future, Mauritian scientists can work with us. Um, it also means that there's going to have to be rigorous review of new policies and particularly of any resettlement feasibility studies to make sure that the physical and economic developments that, that might be put forward are in accordance with the strict marine reserve. That's going to be very important. And I think it's also important that sort of current divisions that have existed for some years now to do with the, the, the MPA, the, these are counterproductive. And really, it's time that there is better collaboration, and more joined up thinking. Um, we have the largest no-take MPA. It's there now, and our task really is to undertake the science and exemplify sound and effective management. And we need to work together to achieve that, rather than perhaps to keep going back to historical arguments 
and we need to find a way of working together to really bring this about and uh, make this no-take MPA one that sits alongside the other big ocean networks uh, within the big ocean network as an important large ocean legacy marine reserve. So thanks very much. <clears throat>